It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier was asked about the fees his government wants to impose on seniors to force them into long-term care homes that they don't want to go into. He said, I'll pretty well guarantee it's not going to be $1,800. Will the Premier make an absolute guarantee today that no senior will be charged that fee? And to reply, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, in fact, the only people that have been talking about a fee like that for seniors who are going to long-term care homes has actually been the opposition. They're the only ones, Mr. Speaker, that have talked about it. The leader of the opposition, the critic, and the members of the Liberal Party, and of course the media, but only as they're reporting what they have been saying, Mr. Speaker. We have been saying right from the beginning that the goal of this is to ensure that those who are waiting to go into a long-term care home who have been discharged or about to be discharged from a hospital have a better opportunity, better outcomes, Mr. Speaker. That is what this legislation was all about. And I'm glad this is another step. Yesterday was another step on the road to improving health care in the province of Ontario, a step that started with Ontario Health Teams, a step that continued with 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds in every region of the province, with the addition of 27,000 health care workers Response? for long-term care alone, Mr. Speaker, with new hospitals in every part of, uh, of the province, Mr. Speaker. It is another step to making Ontario the best health care system in the country and in North America, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Again to the Premier. Well, that didn't sound like a guarantee from the Premier. These numbers, these charges may not matter much to the Premier, but it's literally a matter of life and death for many seniors across this province. The government is ramming Bill 7 through today with virtually no debate. They refuse to hear from families and frontline workers who say this bill will be devastating. And now the Premier is literally not giving any guarantees about what people will be charged. If we can't get a guarantee that $1,800 is not on the books, how much does the Premier think premiers th sorry, how much does the Premier think seniors should be charged? To respond, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's not about the cost. It's about giving proper health care to people that should be in long-term long -term care. It's uh, differentiating between sticking your loved one in a hospital bed. Imagine that, a hospital bed with one of your loved ones when the alarms are going off, bells are going off all night, compared to giving them a beautiful home to stay in, a long-term care home, which will have proper care. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me remind the opposition, they were preaching at the top of the top of the mountain saying, get people out of the hospitals. They kept going on and on, and many of them were quoted in the media. All of a sudden, now they changed their tune. You can't have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. The right place to put uh, uh, people that have been discharged from the doctor is in a proper home for proper care to make sure they have a better quality of life. The final supplementary. Again to the Premier. The Premier is charging ahead with changes that will devastate people's lives. And he can't even or won't even answer basic questions about those changes. Seniors are being told that they will either have to move hundreds of kilometers away from their loved ones, or they will have to pay huge fees. Fees the Premier has either not figured out or is not willing to reveal. Will the Premier do the right thing, admit that this dangerous scheme was rushed, and pull Bill 7 today? Respond to the Premier. I've never ever seen all CEOs agree across the province. All frontline health care uh, people agree. All doctors agree. The only people that don't agree with this plan is the NDP because they're going back and forth every single day. They're being political. We aren't being political. We're making sure we're taking sure. care of the people that need support that need patient care. They're going to get much better care in a long-term care uh, facility than sitting in a hospital bed. Even one of the CEOs said, you know, this is not good 
for the ALC patients. What is good is to make sure they get proper care, and that's what we're going to give them. As the Minister of Long-Term Care said, we're building 58,000 homes for these seniors. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. At hearings held by the NDP this week, frontline health care workers sounded the alarms about the Ford Government Bill 7. The bill does nothing to address the human resources crisis in our health care system, but it will force frail seniors into private long-term care homes miles away from their circle of care and their family. Which raises the question, Speaker, is the goal of the bill to help patients or is it to force frail elderly seniors into private for-profit long-term care homes that no one wants to live in. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, the, the members continue to do this, right? We heard the member from Windsor yesterday say that we were going to be sending people from Windsor to Timmins. Completely not the case, Mr. Speaker. We've heard them talk about huge fees. Obviously not the case, Mr. Speaker. They say that it's a new problem, but let's look at the Auditor General's report of 2012. 2012. And I quote, given our aging population, developing alternatives to long-term care and implementing more efficient processes for placing people in long-term care homes is a consistent and timely manner, in a consistent and timely manner is critical. She went on to say, numerous studies have shown that remaining in hospital longer than medically necessary, including waiting in a hospital for long-term care, can be detrimental to a person's health for various reasons, among them the potential for acquired infections such as C. difficile, and for older patients, a decline in physical and mental abilities due to lack of activity. Response. She went on to say that five provinces have a first bed policy. This is back in 2012 report based on 2011. What was done in 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18? Butter. Nothing. Supplementary question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, the long-term care homes with the most available beds are the ones with the worst records of caring for seniors. Orchard Villa is a private for profit long term care facility in Pickering where armed forces found residents living in horrifying conditions. Durham police have not ruled out criminal charges. It's no surprise that their wait lists are short, literally 42 times shorter than not for profit homes of comparable size. My question is if a patient doesn't want to be moved to a private facility like this, why would the government force them? Long -term care. This is the same member, the very same member who said that we were going to be forcing people into three and four bedroom wards, uh, Mr. Speaker. Now, of course, that hasn't been allowed in the province of Ontario since we made those changes, right, colleagues? It, it didn't happen 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18. It didn't happen when they had the balance of power. It happened under this government. This is the same member who said we would be sending people thousands of kilometres away from their home. Not true. Not true three and four ward bedrooms, not true thousands of extra dollars. What is true? More resources, better care, Mr. Speaker. We're standing up for seniors who want better care, who are on a long term care waiting list. They want to be in a home. Experts agree it is better to get that care in a long term care facility, Mr. Speaker. This is another step on the way of finally tackling Response. the challenges in health care that include staffing, that include more hospitals, that include better long term care homes. They should get on board, Mr. Speaker, because the status quo is working for nobody. The final supplementary. Once again, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Premier. Let's be clear, 70 people died in this facility. Over 100 staff got sick. They died of, well, didn't die of sto spoiled diapers, dehydration, cockroaches, flies everywhere. My question is, Time and time again, the government has bent over backwards for, to support for profit long term care. They exempted them from legal liability, ignored their own commissioner's call to eliminate profit in long term care, and granted facilities like Orchard Villa license renewals of 30 years worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now they are literally threatening seniors with massive fees if they refuse to move to these homes. Does this government truly believe? that this is fair to seniors and their families as 5,000 people have died under your watch in the last four years. Thank you. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Members, please take your seat.
to reply? Government, Government House. We have seen the level of care increase in this province like it has never happened before. Yeah. Under our watch, Mr. Speaker, under our watch, his own riding is getting $55 million more oh, wow. for care in the homes that he has, Mr. Speaker. Under our watch, I have approved over 500 long, new long-term care beds for people in his riding alone, Mr. Speaker. Under our watch, investments in health care have grown to the highest level in Canadian history. Under our watch, a new hospital in Mississauga. Under our watch, small and medium-sized hospitals finally get budgets that are equivalent to large hospitals. Under our watch, the largest investment in health care in Ottawa's Order. history, Mr. Speaker. Response. Under our watch, new hospitals in Niagara, Mr. Speaker. Under our watch, four hours of care for seniors, Mr. Speaker. Under our watch, 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds. Under our watch, we'll get it done. Stop the clock. Order. Order. the member for Windsor West to come to order and the government house leader to please come to order. We'll start the clock again. The member for no, over here. Member for Davenport. Thank you. This question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, after a really tough two years, students are heading back to school next week in, a, in need of a lot of extra care, a lot of extra support. Thankfully, they're going to get some of that support from dedicated education workers, from educational assistants, to food service workers, to the custodians who are keeping HVAC systems working. Speaker, contracts with these CUPE workers are set to expire today. Will the Premier commit to hiring more education workers so that students have the services they need at this very crucial time? The Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We can confirm that under this progressive Conservative government, we are actually increasing the amount of staffing in this province by 3,000 more for this coming September. More custodians, more EAs, more ECs and educators who make a difference in our schools. That is part of our vision for a more normal and, frankly, a much more stable September for these kids. Yes, with more people in the schools. But in addition to more dollars, Speaker, we're asking and expecting a higher standard for our kids. We need these children to be immersed in learning with a stable environment that keeps them there from September right to June in a normal, fulsome experience that includes the sports, the extracurriculars and clubs that produce the well-rounded leaders we all want. Mr. Speaker, our intention for September is to ensure that these kids get back on track with a learning recovery plan that invests over $650 million more million for this September to ensure these kids are well supported and get back on track. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the government talks about stability, but the only person risking disruption in this school year is this minister. I want to go back to the Premier. The Order. average income of these education workers is just $39,000 a year. 91 per cent report that they are facing financial hardship, and more than half of them have to take a second job just to make ends meet. Will this Premier commit to a wage increase so that the workers who support our kids every single day can support their own families? The Minister of Education to reply. Yet again. The New Democrats and Liberals abdicate their responsibility. The member didn't even ask the question citing the priority of keeping kids in school, which ought to be the priority of every MPP in this place. Mr. Speaker, our priority is ensuring stability for children. The question should focus on our kids, and it's about time the opposition please starts to get on, get on track with that imperative of stability for kids. That's why we've ensured more monies in place for September. It's why we've been negotiating good faith to land a fair deal for the workers but a good deal for our families. And Mr. Speaker, the principle that we're going to communicate to the union, to the board of trustees, and to the people of this province is we'll stand up for stability for your children. Thank you, Speaker. Sabrina and her husband, Jack, are both registered nurses. Their four-year-old daughter, Hazel. Oh, I Mistake. I apologize. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. My 
question is for the Solicitor General. Speaker, Peel has experienced an increased number of gun-related crimes. And I would also like to welcome Chief Niche and Director Payet of Peel Police and really congratulate our brave men and women in uniform from Peel on leadership on issues like combating human trafficking, mental health, and community safety. Speaker. Yes, thank you. Unfortunately, it is not rare to hear the news about innocent Ontarians being caught in a crossfire, both figuratively and literally. Monsieur le Président, Mississauga Mr. Speaker, in Mississauga, there was an increase in violence, gun violence. Doing to combat gang-fueled violence and smuggled guns in Peel. Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member from Mississauga Centre's question. Monsieur le Président, to Mr. Speaker, everyone have a right to have health and safety in their activities. Enforcement agencies across the province to keep Ontario safe, and our government has invested over $200 million to combat gun and gang violence. This unprecedented investment includes $6 million for CCTV cameras for municipalities and First Nations, and we're investing over $267 million through the Community Safety and Policing Grant Program to help police services address priority issues in their community. Monsieur le Président, notre gouvernement a Our government has reinforced sec public security from first to the last level. And the supplementary, the member for Brampton West. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. My constituents in Brampton West are deeply concerned about the crime in Peel, especially when smuggled guns and illicit drugs are involved. Every day they hear on the news, Mr. Speaker, about the gang violence fueled by smuggled guns and drugs. My question to the minister is, can the minister tell what is our government's plan to combat the drug flow in Peel? Mr. General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, I, I really am happy that we have the question from the member from Brampton West, because this is an important question. Community safety is a top priority, not just for those who work in and support Ontario's policing services, but for all Ontario families. And since our government came to office, we've invested over $17 million in grants for policing in Peel Region alone. In fact, yesterday, the Poli Peel Regional Police announced the results of outstanding work on Project Warrior. Peel Regional Police used the funding provided by the Ministry of the Solicitor General combined with excellent investigative work to take a staggering $12 million of illicit drugs off the street. I want to congratulate Chief... Stop the clock. Still time? Is there still time? Is there still time? Okay. Security. The security of our province is very important. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Sabrina and her husband, Jack, are both registered nurses. Their four-year-old daughter, Hazel, lives with type 1 diabetes and is starting junior kindergarten in September. In what should be a time of excitement for a young family, Sabrina will have to take an unpaid leave of absence to administer medication to her daughter at school. Hazel's on a wait list. There is not one single community nurse available that can come into the classroom each day and assist Hazel with managing her needs. Premier, we are in the midst of a staff crisis. With this province already short 30,000 nurses, will this government commit to more community nurses for schools so healthcare workers like Sabrina and Jack aren't forced to choose between their families and their jobs? Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, uh, I love being able to highlight all of the work that our government is doing to increase the number of health human resources that practice and work in the province of Ontario. There is no doubt that across Canada and indeed the world, we are experiencing shortages in our critically important health care system. However, 
what we have seen here in Ontario is by investing $35 million to increase enrollment in nursing education programs, we are actually expanding spaces to introduce over 1,130 new practical nurses and 870 registered nurses into the healthcare system. I have been working with the College of Nurses of Ontario to make sure that individuals who have applied to practice and work in the province of Ontario get those applications reviewed and expedited quickly. We'll continue to Response. do this because people like uh, Hazel need to have that confidence when, that when their young daughter goes to school, they have the resources they need to make sure that her diabetes is monitored and they're looked after. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the uh, Premier, through the Minister. Increasing nurses at this time for Jack and Sabrina doesn't help. There are RNs. They work in. They are nurses, and their workplace will be short now that they have to go and look after their daughter. During the pandemic, we saw that working mothers became de became the default parent, leaving their jobs to manage virtual learning during a time when daycares and schools were closed. Now, nursing shortages have trickled down to the education sector. Every child has the right to equal access to education, and every parent deserves to know their child has the care they need when they need it, without sacrificing their career. Premier, will your government commit to a plan to ensure working mothers like Sabrina are not forced out of the workplace that is already in a severe crisis to fill gaps within an already broken system? Mr. Education. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member officer for the question, and we do agree. I mean, these children should have access to the practitioners they need wherever they are, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, it was two years ago, working with the Minister of Finance under the Premier's leadership, we actually doubled the number of public health nurses that work in our schools, 640 public health nurses working Order. in schools, and the members opposite posed the question, where are they? At a time when frontline workers are making a difference in our schools and our communities, we should be grateful for their contributions to our kids and to our communities. Order. It's precisely why we more than doubled the allocation. It's why we increased Opposition the investments overall for special education by an additional $90 million for this year. It is now at the highest levels ever recorded in the history of this province because we want those kids to get the services they deserve. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to increase investments, Response. increase access to staff and practitioners, work with the Minister of Health across ministries to improve the services for the kids of this province. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Speaker, the cost of road congestion continues to take its toll on my constituents and their quality of life. Congestion impacts Ontario's economy with billions of dollars a year in lost time, wasted fuel, and delayed deliveries. Other costs include greenhouse gas emissions, accidents, and poorer health since people perpetually stuck in traffic report lower life satisfaction and physical activity. Experts and academics have already warned that Ontario's transportation infrastructure is not ready for the incoming surge of new Ontarians in the next 20 years. The status quo is not sustainable especially if every new Ontarian decides to hop into a car during rush hour. Speaker, what actions are the Minister of Transportation taking uh, to build critical road infrastructure? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton North for the question. Highway gridlock is a problem that continues to plague communities across Ontario. And why is that, Speaker? It's because successive Liberal governments simply chose not to invest and chose not to build, despite knowing that the growth was coming to this province. Right. Speaker, we know that the opposition is driven by an ideological opposition to new highways, and that is simply offside with where Ontarians are. People rely on cars to get to work, home, and more, and if we don't start building now, already intense gridlock will only get worse for Ontario drivers. 401 is already the most congested highway in North America, and within the next decade alone, all major highways in the region, including Highway 407, are expected to be at or exceed capacity during rush hour. Under the leadership of this Once. Premier, our PC government is doing what the Liberals refused to do and get done years ago, and that's build the Highway 413. Here, here. Any supplementary questions? 
Uh, thank you uh, for the answer to that question. Uh, speaker, it's, it's clear that road congestion costs the economy billions of dollars annually and will only worsen as our population grows. In 2019, uh, the National Post reported actually that Toronto was North America's fastest growing city and also Canada's most congested. Peel Region and the surrounding communities also face the same predicament as they are some of the fastest growing in this province and equally the most congested. My constituents value their time, Mr. Speaker, and driving remains the fastest way to travel for most commuters, according to Stats Canada data. That same Statistics Canada data shows that their drive time is increasing yearly. Speaker, what actions are the Minister of Transportation taking to build major highways in this province, helping to ease the congestion crisis that has dragged on for far too long? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, gridlock is not just going to disappear, and neither is commercial traffic. Building Highway 413 is just the kind of bold action we need to avoid the next generation of drivers being stuck in traffic. It's a key piece of our government's transportation plan that will make the difference between calling home to say that you're stuck in traffic or tucking your kids into bed at night. Speaker, I am pleased with the support that we've received to date on this, pro on this project, including from Leuna's International Vice President, Joseph Mancinelli, who has said our government, I quote, continues to demonstrate progressive leadership in investing in critical infrastructure like Highway 413 that will aim to address future growth and the demands of our municipalities, unquote. And Todd Letts, CEO of Brampton's Board of Trade, who commended our government for prioritizing projects like Highway 413. Speaker, as we saw in this past election, support for Highway 413 Fonts. is strong, and our government will get it done. Next, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in February, 83-year-old Don Wilson slipped and cracked his pelvis. Four days after admission to London Health Sciences Centre, Don was transferred to a long-term care home, a home that was in COVID outbreak with only two PSWs for a ward of 30 residents and no rehab services. Less than a week later, Don fell out of his LTC bed and was readmitted to hospital, where tragically, on April 15th, he passed away. Speaker, is this the kind of trauma and grief that more families will face with Bill 7? And to respond, the Minister of Health. You know, Speaker, every example is tragic when it ends up in death. But the member opposite is talking about the past, and our government is focused on making improvements in the future. We have talked and we have acted on home care in particular. I often Order. talk about how, as a government, we are ensuring that hospital has capacity, that community care has capacity, that long-term care has capacity, that primary care has capacity. We're doing that through investments. Specifically related to um, home care, I want to highlight the billion dollars that is in our most recent budget, which will ensure that 739 nursing visits are able to be provided in community, 157,000 nursing shift hours in community, 117,000 therapy visits, Response. including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and speed language pathology in community. It's what people deserve, it's what people expect, and it's what we are delivering. Supplementary question. Speaker, when Dawn's wife, Jane Burgess, heard about Bill 7, she contacted me to share her story. Jane and Dawn were told by the hospital that Dawn was being transferred to LTC and were not given any time to discuss or consider other options. Jane continues to live with the guilt that she didn't say no, but she was overwhelmed and felt they had no choice. Speaker, this was before the new powers under Bill 7 to admit patients to long-term care without their consent. No family should have to go through this. Will the government do the right thing and withdraw Bill 7? Mr. Health. You know, Speaker, I, I think that the member opposite is forgetting that the health care system as a whole needs to cooperatively work together for the patient. That is our goal as a government. You know, I, I point to uh, Anthony Dale from the Ontario Hospitals Association in reference specifically to alternative level of care patients. Health care providers in Ontario are committed to working collaboratively with patients, with substitute decision makers, families and caregivers during any 
any transmit transition into patient care. We are transitioning people into their homes with sufficient community care support. We are transitioning patients into long-term care homes with sufficient support. We're getting it done because we understand at the end of the day, alternative level of care patients Fine. deserve better than sitting in a hospital waiting for their next transition. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last March, the ministry, without explanation, reported the long overdue replacement of Caledonia's Argyle Street Bridge would be delayed another year. During an inspection in 2001, it was determined the bridge was in a state of deterioration. Keep in mind the current bridge was completed in 1927. It's now over 20 years overdue and one and a half years since notice of delay by this government. Speaker, the approvals have been in place for many years, and yet the July 1st parade in Caledonia took an alternative route to avoid the bridge due to safety concerns. Speaker, the people of Caledonia, of Haldeman County, want to know what's holding up the reconstruction of the Argyle Street Bridge. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. I want to assure her that completing the replacement of the Argyle Street Bridge is a priority for our government. As she correctly pointed out, this is a century-old bridge, and its restoration is long overdue. Uh, unfortunately, the Liberals had over a decade to take action and address this issue, but instead they did nothing. Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure the member opposite can appreciate, our government is doing its due diligence to ensure that we get this right before putting shovels in, shovels in the ground. This includes consulting with First Nation communities that are potentially impacted by this project, and as well conducting early work projects to conserve the toll house and potential archaeological resources before the bridge replacement begins. This early work is slated to begin, Mr. Speaker, this fall. Our government is making great progress to get shovels in the ground for this project. It is a priority for our government, and we will get it done. The supplementary question. Thank you. Speaker, Argonne Street is the main thoroughfare of Caledonia, and the bridge serves both local and commercial vehicles. In 2019, the ministry set up stoplights at the bridge after the load posting was reduced to eight tons. These lights help clear traffic in the event fire trucks must make a pass. August 2020, MTO boarded up the famous toll house, occupied by Lori Harcourt. The ministry claimed it needed to expropriate the property on the north side of the Grand River so reconstruction could begin. Speaker, the ministry kicked this woman out of her home, and yet nothing is happening. I fear a national headline if the ministry does not get to work. The community has been waiting for over 20 years. The people of Caledonia are waiting for any government, perhaps this government, to make them a priority. Speaker, we all want to know what is holding up the reconstruction of the Argyle Street Bridge? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to be clear. The Ministry of Transportation only acquires properties that are absolutely necessary for the construction of a project, and we are committed to treating all affected property owners fairly. Expropriations are a backstop measure only. Um, as the project on this as the work on this project continues, uh, we've taken interim measures to, con to preserve, uh, to protect the safety of the travelling public that use the bridge. This includes implementing, as the member pointed out, further load restrictions for vehicles and completing temporary repair work that's necessary to maintain the serviceability of the bridge. Mr. Speaker, we have been making great progress. The detailed design of the Argyle Street replacement is already complete, and now we're in the process of obtaining the final approvals to proceed to construction. Speaker, we will not take any shortcuts when it comes to getting critical infrastructure built. Here, here, here. The next question, Saga Singh. Thank you so much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, for over a decade, under the previous Liberal government, the citizens of Mississauga and the region of Peel were abandoned. We saw jobs leaving our region and infrastructure projects that needed repair never being prioritized. Under the Liberals' watch, many of my constituents were shut out of gainful employment. Unemployment among young people was worse in Ontario than in Rust Belt states like Indiana and Ohio. Speaker, my very own brother, a skilled automation specialist, left Ontario six years ago due to lack of economic opportunities and settled instead in British Columbia. We certainly could have used his skills right here in Ontario. Speaker, the citizens of Mississauga are hardworking and sacrifice every day to Question. make Ontario a better place to live and grow. 
What is our government doing to ensure that my constituents have good, secured, well-paying jobs for themselves and their children years into the future? Mr. Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The NDP gave up on Ontario's manufacturing. In their last economic report, hear their true intention. Quote, shifting employment from goods producing industries, in particular manufacturing, to the service sector. That's what they intended to do. But we changed all that, Speaker, by lowering the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually. We lowered taxes, we cut red tape, we reduced their hydro rates. That's why investments in Mississauga keep on coming. Cyclone Manufacturing invested $21 million to reshore from the U.S. a project and create 60 aerospace jobs. Bora Pharmaceuticals invested $2.5 million in Mississauga to scale up their operation. And there are what? dozens of auto parts manufacturers who inv have invested in their companies through our auto modernization program. Mississauga is, again, where businesses are invested. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. It is encouraging that our government is focusing on investments that are protecting Mississauga and Peel Region's tech and advanced manufacturing sectors. But, Speaker, these are billion-dollar investments which are possible only for a small number of large businesses. While these large businesses employ thousands of people in my riding, what about the small companies and the startups? Small businesses and startups are the backbone of our economic strength as a province. I know many constituents whose small businesses like Palma Pasta, Lazio Bakery, or Hub Rock Climbing Gym are integral to what makes my riding work and thrive. But as we all know, starting a business is hard work and is filled with risk. What is our government doing to help entrepreneurs in my riding Question. and city to start and grow their businesses? Economic development. Small businesses account for 98% of our economy and employ millions of families. Yet for 15 years, the Liberals and the NDP made small business ownership difficult and costly. We are on a mission to reverse the Liberal and the NDP era anti-business policies. With our support, Mississauga's entrepreneurs now have all the tools they need to grow their businesses. We're providing Mississauga's Small Business Enterprise Center with $420,000 to support local companies, another $112,000 to support Mississauga's summer company and their starter company plus. These are, are companies that help students and young entrepreneurs start businesses of their own. We want entrepreneurs to know that this Response. government understands them and we fully support their success. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Judy, who resides in a long-term care residence in Hamilton, has reached out to my office, and her concerns are alarming. Judy tells me the staff are overworked, beyond exhausted, and most are working double shifts due to staffing shortages. A few nights ago, there was one PSW on her floor. She was left to work alone until 4 a.m. when an RN from a private agency was brought in. Thankfully, none of the 27 residents, including Judy, had a medical emergency fall or worse. Speaker, what is the Premier doing to ensure these homes are staffed to a level of safety and to a level that the caregivers, which they were promised, for their loved ones? Mr. Long-Term Care. Well, again, Speaker, we, we started uh, increasing staffing in, in our long-term care homes in the last parliament, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member will know that uh, we've increased funding by over $4.9 billion because we are the first government in North America to go to a a standard of four hours of care per day. Now, the member will remember that, that she voted against the increase uh, in staffing, and she will remember that she actually voted, the member opposite voted against the increase in staffing for the homes in her own riding. Speaker. But more importantly than that, the member opposite uh, was part of a caucus that supported a Liberal Party that between 2009 and 2018, Mr. Speaker, despite a report from the Auditor General suggesting that we had to do more for long-term care in 2012, the last three Liberal administrations 
only managed to increase care for our seniors and homes response by six minutes mr speaker six minutes shameful order we are on our way and we will have four hours of care because of the investments that we have made and that is a very good difference the supplementary question. Sir, this minister, I will vote against his bad bills each and every time, as I will Bill 7. Order. Not repealing, not repealing Bill 124, Order. and the push to move residents from ALC to long-term care is not going to solve the issues. PSWs are Order. nervous, and they're fearful that they're not able to provide the care necessary. Judy goes on to tell me that she's worried for her neighbours, other seniors and their caregivers who visit daily to fill in the gaps. Her request was clear. Premier, when will you admit the reality of long-term care and support and protect health care workers who residents like Judy depend on? Stop the clock. Okay. Kitchener, come to order. The member for Niagara West, come to order. We start the clock. Minister of Long-Term Care. Well, I, I know the, minister, the member opposite will vote against improvements in long-term care because the member voted against the increases in uh, long-term care capacity in her own riding. Additional beds, the member voted against that, Mr. Speaker. The member talks about this legislation, what it does specifically, Speaker, is ensure that somebody who is a patient in a hospital is about to be discharged, with that we're able to match up an appropriate home. So exactly what the member is talking about is what the whole point of this bill is. Order. Looking at the services that a person needs if they're going to be discharged from a hospital, does the long-term care home have the services that that patient needs to care for them properly, to care for them better, Mr. Order. Speaker? It also includes $5 million of support this year, right now, for behavioral services of, on of Ontario. It includes $2.6 million of support for a partnership with Baycrest to have leading-edge leading edge services, behavioral uh, uh, services, uh, Mr. Speaker, and a $20 million local uh, priorities uh, in, uh, uh, fund, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that no every home, frankly, has what the senior needs before they get there. Thank you. <laughs> member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, come to order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My constituent, Summer, has contacted my office to express concern about the. Again, I apologize. Next question, the member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has more than 370,000 unfilled jobs. There's a rising need to replace retiring skilled tradespeople. A report from the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum suggests that Ontario needs to recruit 300,000 new skilled trade apprentice apprentices over the next decade just to keep up with the retirement retirements. Training new skilled trade workers must be a priority, and it's crucial for us to promote the skilled trades among young people. What is the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development doing to help more young people start careers in the skilled trades? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training, Skills Development. But you know, I want to thank the member from Essex for really uh, being such a strong voice for better jobs and bigger paychecks for the people of Essex. <laughs> Speaker, uh, unlike those in other parties who want to, quote, phase out well-paying uh, and in-demand careers, our government knows that our skilled trades workers are heroes and we need more of them. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we are leading the way with a historic investment of more than a billion dollars over the next three years. With this unprecedented funding increase, we're working with employers and our labour partners to reduce the stigma around these meaningful careers and expand training opportunities. Mr. Speaker, when you have a job in the trades, you really do have a job for life, and you can be damn proud of what you build. Supplementary question. To the minister again, traditionally women represent less than 10 per cent of skilled trade workers, and that's just not enough. As we face a labour shortage, attracting and retaining women in the skilled trades will be very important to fill the labour gap. My constituents in Essex are very happy that this government and this minister 
are providing free training for 500 people from underrepresented groups in the trades, especially women. So how is this investment going to make, how is this investment going to remove barriers specifically for women and also remove barriers for other underrepresented groups in the skilled trades and get people into those well-paying jobs and those rewarding careers in the skilled trades? Mr. Labor. Yeah, this is a, a great question, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government is really working every day to spread opportunity more widely and fairly to every corner of this province. Pre-apprenticeships, like the member uh, mentioned, really do lift people up and help them move off of social assistance and into a meaningful career. Uh, people like Natisha, a single mom who got to buy the tools she needed and tried different uh, trades in the construction industry through the Hammerheads program. Mr. Speaker, she's now making $44.08 an hour with a defined pension and benefit, truly a life-changing uh, career for Natisha. Uh, she's been able to buy a car, and I remember talking to her. She told me for the first time in her life, her two daughters look up to her. Mr. Speaker, we need more life-changing stories like Natisha's. Response. That's why we're working every day. We're on a mission to get more people into these amazing careers. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My constituent, Summer, has contacted my office to express concern about the high temperature in her apartment. A candle in her apartment even melted on its own accord. The temperature must have hit at least 46 degrees Celsius or higher to melt a paraffin candle. Speaker, people will pass out from heat exhaustion or even die from heat stroke in this temperature. The Ontario Human Rights Commission recently ruled access to cooling during extreme heat waves is a human rights issue. Will the Premier today obey the Human Rights Commission of this province and make air conditioning a vital service and establish a maximum temperature in apartments? If not, why not? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, our government appreciates uh, the work of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, as the member uh, noted, uh, recently the Human Rights Commission has uh, issued a statement regarding uh, air conditioning in apartments. We take uh, those recommendations very seriously and uh, we'll consider it as we do uh, when we look at issues regarding the Residential Tenancies Act. Supplementary member for University Rosedale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is back to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to quote the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Access to cooling during extreme heat waves is a human rights issue. At most risk are people with disabilities, older people and low-income people, Indigenous, Black and other racialized communities. This vulnerability is also compounded by social isolation and poverty. The Ontario Human Rights Commission calls on the Government of Ontario to include air conditioning as a vital service, like the provision of heat under RTA regulations." End quote. Over 500 people died in BC during their last heat wave, and the vast majority of them were elderly people who lived alone in unair conditioned apartments. Will this government listen to the Ontario Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission, and make Question. AC a vital service and set a maximum temperature for homes? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for her, uh, her comments and her interest. Uh, uh, she's placed a number of uh, housing recommendations uh, in this House, um, and we appreciate that. Um, we would uh, hope uh, that uh, her party and herself uh, would consider as well some of the amendments and proposals we've made. Um, we've uh, stood up uh, for tenants uh, on numerous times in this House. Her party uh, and her specifically uh, have voted against all of those measures. Every time we want to stand up and give the tenants better compensation, uh, we want to crack down on landlords uh, who abuse tenants. Uh, every time we've done that, Speaker, uh, that member and her party have voted against it. Uh, so my question back to her, uh, are you Response? going to support uh, pro-tenant measures? Are you going to support uh, landlord measures that we've put into place? Uh, and do you want to build upon our success? There you are. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since the 90s, the involvement of women in the skilled trades has been less than 5% of the total workforce. 
A recent news article detailed the challenges many women in the trades face. Poor retention was identified as a contributing factor for the low number of women in the field. That's why we must increase female representation in the skilled trades. Ontario has a massive skilled jobs crisis, and we need all hands on deck to help us build a stronger province. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity please inform the House of the progress made by our government in encouraging young women to enter the skilled trades? Mr. Women's and, so and, so women's and uh, Social and Economic Responsibility. Opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Carleton for the question. Mr. Speaker, I recently spoke to a young woman named Sophie who shared with me a time when she had left her partner and was left with no job, no home, and no financial stability. When she was in the shelter, she was able to access their back-to-work program that enabled her to enter the carpentry trade. Now she is a successful journey person and is on the job site. Here, here. That's awesome. Her credo has been, if you can see me, you can be me. And she is inspiring other young women to enter the trade so that they can experience the same rewards and financial stability that she has. Women like Sophie show us the progress that our investments and programs are making. And they need us to accelerate their efforts so that more women can follow their footsteps and see the further progress in changing the landscape of the trades. Response? I've said it before on this floor, Mr. Speaker, women belong in all places, in all spaces, and at every table. And Mr. Speaker, that includes a construction site. Oh, <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister. Speaker, a career in skilled trades has countless benefits. Jobs in this field are in high demand, pay well, and will comprise 20 per cent of jobs by 2025. I recall travelling Ottawa with uh, the Minister of Labour in the previous legislative session, and uh, it was very inspiring to see so many young women in the trades when we visited IBEW, as well as uh, when I've also visited the steelworkers. So, Mr. Speaker, with women, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share details on the programs put in place by our government to raise awareness and encourage young women to consider a career in the skilled trades? Thank you. Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. So, Mr. Speaker, our government invested record amounts into the skills trade strategy. $288 million in the 2021 budget and $90 million in the 2021 fall economic statement. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, we have proposed an additional $114 million over the next three years in the 2022 budget. Within that, we've invested $22 million this year to enhance the Ontario Youth Entrepreneurship Program. Mr. Speaker, these investments will help women and girls to explore the skilled trades and set them on the path towards financial stability. As part of this funding, school boards can request additional funding to promote 14 trades in which women are historically underrepresented. Response? That is why it is imperative that all members support the 22 budget and help deliver the resources they need not to just get by in our economy but to get ahead in our economy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. The member for London, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, many of my constituents have reached out horrified about creeping privatization and the overt destruction of our treasured public health care system under the Ford government. Ryan wrote to me about how the care he received for his aortic stenosis would have cost at least a quarter million dollars. Wow. Without it, he would not be alive. He remains deeply thankful, but worries about the deteriorating quality of health care and this government's obvious movement towards profit-making in health care. Will this government continue to destroy health care with their privatization agenda or finally fund health care and health care workers properly? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Again, the member's question gives me an opportunity to highlight the five-point plan that we have put in place and are driving towards efficiencies 
in innovation within our healthcare system. You know, things like easing pressure on emergency departments by actually investing and launching new provincial emergency department peer-to-peer -peer programs, investing over $300 million as part of the province's surgical recovery. We are encouraging innovation in our healthcare sector. Those um, ideas are coming forward for review and assessment, and we are making the investments to ensure that people get the health care they need, when they need it, where they want it, which is in their community. Please. Thank you. Supplementary question. My question is back to the Premier and through you, Speaker, respectfully to the Minister. How about they come up with a six-point plan and scrap Bill 124? Yeah. <laughs> Underfunding health care by $1.8 billion last year was a destructive act, and so is Bill 124. And now the government claims the system they've been strangling is barely breathing. This government manufactured this crisis in order to promote privatization. Heather wrote to me about her stepfather being pushed out of hospital into a for-profit long-term care home where they would then squeeze an additional $4,000 per month for his care. Is this government morally and ethically comfortable padding the pockets of the private long-term care industry and private for-profit hospitals rather than fix our public system and pay health care heroes what they deserve? Good question. <laughs> The, the member opposite is, uh, frankly, Speaker, spinning a tail. We have, through our actions, invested to ensure that today, right now, in the province of Ontario, there are 400 doctors practicing in rural and northern Ontario who weren't there today, th three, three years ago. You know, we've invested to make sure that when internationally educated healthcare professionals want to practice in the province of Ontario and have submitted their license, their application into the College of Nurses or the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, we ha are acting to make sure that those are being assessed and given appropriate review quickly so that they can practice. We know that there are people across Ontario who want to practice in healthcare in Ontario, and we're expediting that process to ensure that we have those people in place where we need them. Thank you, you Speaker. Next question, the member for Windsor, Tecumseh. Ma ma question for the Minister of I asked this question to the Minister of Francophone Affairs throughout the pandemic. There has been several impacts on small businesses in Ontario, especially in Francophone businesses in Ontario. For many of them, they are facing many difficulties in terms of supply chains and on the global scale. From a constituent in my writing, there's a need for Francophone support, and many of those business, businesses had difficulties to have access to, to, to our support as a government. We have to make sure to, to address this issue, and especially for Francophone Ontarians who want to contribute to our economy. The Minister, Minister of Francophone Affairs, can you please explain to us what is the government doing in order to help our small businesses in order to get out of this situation. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for this question. This question. We add a funding available for small businesses in Ontario. We have also helped to amplify francophone businesses in Ontario. And we have 38 businesses here to help those businessmen and businesswomen. This funding is here to help long-term development for francophone businesses, and now we have $2 million available. This program will help to support local businesses and regional businesses. We need to have access to qualified workforce, which is essential for these businesses, and that's for this reason that our government is asking the federal government to have more immigration policies to help grow the economy of Ontario. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, the Francophone population in Ontario is essential in our culture, and that's the reason we have to promote 
Francophonie in Ontario in order to help the economic growth of the province. We need to make sure that we are improving networking between businesses, between associations, to help increase opportunities and par partnership. Speaker, can the minister tell us what are the benefits, economic benefits, in order to have a network of francophone businesses in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Our government is giving concrete solutions because we know francophonie is essential to Ontario's economy. In 2020 and 2021, we had an investment of $500 million to help create the Federation of Francophone People in Ontario. And these businesses, these online platforms help to promote goods and services in French in Ontario. Because of an investment of $1.5 billion in three years, Ontario is still expanding services and support available for francophone businessmen and businesswomen. These funds will be beneficial for them in order to use those opportunities here in Ontario and to shine francophony in our communities and outside of Ontario as well. My question is to the Premier. Today, on August 31st, we recognize International Overdose Awareness Day, an annual campaign to end overdose, to remember those lives we have lost to addictions and acknowledge the grief of the family and friends left behind. More than 2,400 Ontarians died from opioid-related causes in 2020. During the first year of the pandemic, there was a 96 per cent increase in apparent opioid toxicity deaths compared to the year before. Since then, deaths have remained high. An increasingly toxic drug supply, increased feelings of isolation, stress and anxiety, and changes in the availability or accessibility of services for people who use drugs has led to the worsening of the opioid crisis. In my community, the Windsor-Essex Community Opioid and Substance Strategy Group has, re has released five alerts already this year due to a high number of opioid-related emergency department visits and overdoses. In 2021, question. 66 people in Windsor-Essex lost their lives to overdoses. Speaker, my question is this. How many lives must be lost before this government takes action to address this crisis? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Speaker, and uh, yes, today is International Overdose Awareness Day, and I want to begin by reflecting and thinking about the families that have lost loved ones and the pain and the suffering that they're experiencing as a result of those losses. I also want to reflect and think on the things that we have done as a government and continue to do. And that's the investments that we make through the Addiction Recovery Fund, the $90 million that went into assuring that there are supports and services. We've invested in 400 beds, 7,000 treatment spots. These are all investments that are being made by the government because it recognizes the importance of providing the supports for mental health and for addictions in the province of Ontario. And I'm also reflecting on the fact that it's this government that's making these significant investments, not former governments, that left the province of Ontario in shambles and not providing Response. supports and services that are needed. It's important that we continue thinking about people that overdose and making sure that we provide supports and services where and when they need them, no matter where they live in the province of Ontario. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 7, an act to amend the Fixing Long-Term Care Act 2021 with respect to patients requiring an alternate level of care and other matters, and to make a consequential amendment to the Health Care Consent Act 1996. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.